So we continue with the question answer session. I have some more questions here. As per Bhagavad Gita, 12th chapter, 19th verse, we don't need to work for getting specific qualities of a pure devotee. But still, if I want to work on a specific quality which I want to acquire, how do I acquire such specific good qualities? So in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 12th chapter, it's called devotional service or Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga has been explained and uh, towards the end of the chapter, Lord Krishna describes the qualities of a pure devotee. And in the explanation, Srila Prabhupada says that uh, without good qualifications, one cannot be a pure devotee. And one who does not have these qualities is not recognized as a devotee. Of course, the devotee does not separately endeavor to acquire these qualifications. Simply by engaging in Krishna consciousness and devotional service, one automatically develops all these good qualities. So if somebody wants to acquire a specific quality, then one has to actually work on those specific qualities uh, but actually that's not the recommendation the recommendation is by actually doing devotional service under proper guidance one can acquire all the good qualities now it doesn't mean that uh, devotional service doesn't involve developing any qualities. Just like in the association of devotees, there is a proper way of behavior of a devotee. Now that behavior is part of what is called as Vaishnava etiquette or devotee etiquette. So following that Vaishnava etiquette, automatically we develop humility, we develop tolerance because it involves uh, being humble, being tolerant with other devotees. So like that, uh, the very practice of devotional service under suitable guidance involves culturing these qualities, though we don't specifically select one quality and work on culturing that quality and then go to the next quality. No, we don't do that. Part of the training in devotional service under suitable guidance involves culturing all the qualities. So therefore, simply by doing the recommended practice of devotional service under suitable guidance, one develops all good qualities. Next question. Can you please explain the purport of Bhagavad Gita 2nd chapter 47th verse? So, Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, 47th verse, is one of the popular verses. Karmanye vadikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana ma karma phalahe turbhu ma te sangosva karmani. So, the translation or the meaning of this verse is Krishna is telling Arjuna, you have a right to perform your prescribed duty. That's the first part of this verse. Karmanye vadikaraste. Ma phaleshu kadachana, but you are not entitled to the fruits of action or the results of your work. You are not entitled to the results. The third part is, Ma karma phala hetu bhu, never consider yourself to be the cause of the results. And the last part is, Ma te sangostu akarmani. <coughs> Never be attached to not doing your duty. So there are clearly four parts to this verse. Let's understand each one. Uh, you have a right to perform your prescribed duty. Duty has to be performed by everybody because non-performance of duty is sinful. Non-performance of duty is sinful. 
it gives sinful reactions. So one has to do one's prescribed duty. But the results of whatever duties we do or actions we do, we are not entitled to the results. Why? Why is Krishna telling like this? It's very simple. Srila Prabhupada explains just like if you call a carpenter to your house and give him all the necessary tools, give him some wood, give him some working space and tell him you have to make a table. Now after the table is uh, prepared, is manufactured or fabricated by the carpenter, can he take the table himself? No. Can he take a part of the table? I put in so much effort. At least can I take a portion of the table? No. He is only entitled to the labor charges. Exactly like that. When we perform any duty, everything is provided for by Krishna. This body that we have, the hands and legs and the eyes and the ears, everything we are using, these are not ours. This belongs to Krishna, Krishna's material nature or material energy. So we have been given this body, given the senses, given the mind, given the intelligence, everything is given to us by Krishna, by arrangement, Krishna's arrangement. Then whatever we utilize, did we bring anything when we took birth? as ours or it's mine. Did I bring anything? Did I, does anybody bring anything into this world? They come empty handed. And when they are to leave at the end of the life, they have to go empty handed. So we don't bring anything. Neither the body is ours. It has been given to us by Krishna. Whatever we may have, which we may think is ours, actually is not ours. It was also given by Krishna. So that being the case, we use whatever instruments, whatever intelligence, whatever resources, whatever facilities, whatever in, uh, raw materials, everything we utilize, ultimately whatever we produce, we cannot take any final product, even a portion of it we cannot take. It belongs to Krishna. Therefore Krishna says you are not entitled to the results of your action. Then Krishna says, never consider yourself to be the cause of the results of your activities. Now the cause of the result, somebody may think, I worked hard, so I am the cause. But actually, you may be one of the causes, but there are so many other causes. Just like if the carpenter you call to your house, if he doesn't have wood, can he manufacture the ta table? No. If he doesn't have the tools, can he manufacture the table? No. If he uh, doesn't have a skill for making table, he won't be called in the first place because he cannot do without a skill. Now who is giving that skill to him? Skill is given by the Supreme Lord. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, I give the ability to any person to do some particular work or activity. So, everything is given by Krishna. Therefore, uh, the cause of the result is not the person who is doing the work, but the cause of the result is Krishna. And never be attached to not doing your duty. If, As I said, if we don't do our duty, then we are incurring sinful reaction. Therefore, Krishna says you must uh, do your duty. So that is the understanding of this particular verse. I'll go to the next question. What happens to the person who commits suicide as it is said to be a sin? When God decides your life, how could this be a sin? Um, committing suicide is sinful because uh, we got this body given to us. We have not done anything to manufacture or fabricate this body. So it is given to us, the body is given to us. 
and it is given for a specific purpose and the duration for which we can have the body is also fixed by the Supreme Lord through the laws of God working in this world. It is fixed and we have no right to end life or to destroy the body or quit the body before the time comes for actually quitting the body. So, uh, therefore, um, committing suicide is sinful. Now, when God decides your life, could this be a sin? God decides life means, according to our past karma, we are given a specific body. According to our past karma, we are given a specific duration of life in the particular body. So, even though God is the one who is actually giving us the body or arranging to give us the body, God is the one who gives us a specific duration. God is not responsible for that because our past activities, we actually um, have become um, um, liable to get the particular body and the particular duration according to the activities we have performed. So, we are the cause of the particular body that we get and we are the cause of the duration that we have. So, we are actually supposed to utilize the body for the purpose for which it is given. The purpose of the body being given is specifically in the human form of life to understand that we cannot be independent of Krishna we are completely dependent on Krishna under all circumstances, in all situations, at all times. Always we are dependent on Krishna. So there is no question of anybody being independent of Krishna. Secondly, the body is given so that we can utilize this body, particularly the human form of body, is a special facility because there is developed intelligence. So the developed intelligence can be utilized to understand who am I, who is God, what is my relationship with God. This is possible specifically in the human form of body. It's not possible in all lower life forms. Though there are many different types of bodies or life forms, but none of them it is possible to know ourselves or understand who is God or to understand the relationship. It's not possible. Therefore, the human body is given for the specific purpose of realizing our self, realizing who is God and realizing the relationship. Therefore, if somebody does not use the body for this particular purpose, then actually they are uh, liable to be uh, punished or they are liable to be, uh, uh, they are going to get a sinful reaction for not utilizing the body for the right purpose. Next question. In Bhagavad Gita, 18th chapter, 47th verse, it is uh, said that everybody has to do their duty born out of their own nature. How to know my prescribed duty with respect to day-to-day -day material life? This is the question that is being asked. Actually, as I explained in an earlier session, uh, the specific duty according to one's nature, acquired nature, is prescribed or is described in the Varnashrama Dharma. Now this Varnashrama Dharma is not practically possible to follow in this age. Therefore, the scriptures say in this age, it is recommended that every person perform some honest work for earning a livelihood, but in addition to that, everyone should engage in chanting and hearing the holy name of God, so that one can actually achieve the purpose of human form of life by becoming self-realized, by becoming God-realized. So our duty becomes to actually chant and hear the holy name of the Supreme Lord and to supplement that activity there are other practices of bhakti just like hearing from the scriptures, worshipping the, the Supreme Lord 
offering food and accepting prasadam etc the different practices of bhakti are recommended as the duties for every human being for actually utilizing the body for the purpose for which it is given next question you told difference between traditional karma yoga and uh, karma yoga as described in bhagavad gita by shrila prabhupad in traditional karma yoga one renounces the result for the supreme cause if somebody does not know who is the supreme cause how can he renounce so it is explained even if one does not know what is the supreme cause if one renounces or sacrifices the result for a good cause that is also going to lead the person to ultimately reach the understanding of who or what is the supreme cause of everything it is explained in the 12th chapter of the bhagavad gita that uh, there are different levels of practicing bhakti so one of the levels of practicing bhakti is knowing that krishna is the supreme lord one sacrifices the results of one's work to krishna offer to krishna if one does not know krishna is the supreme cause of everything then bhagavad gita recommends at least sacrifice the results of your work for some good cause just like people um, uh, give a donation to a orphanage or give a donation to uh, some uh, um, just like now covid 19 is going on there are so many people who don't have job therefore they don't have food so somebody may donate for the cause of feeding such people during such difficult times so all such sacrifices made by people for a good cause is going to make them advanced in devotional service to ultimately one day come to the point of understanding who or what is the supreme cause of everything it will lead to that the next question uh, is a devotee who follows four regulative principles and chants 16 rounds of hari krishna mantra a surrendered soul of lord krishna yes uh, anybody who follows these prescription these prescriptions are given by the acharya shrila prabhupad based on the scriptural directions that everybody should chant the hare krishna mantra if one is serious about perfecting one's life in this very lifetime then shrila prabhupad the acharya recommends that one has to chant 16 rounds of hare krishna mantra each round consists of 108 times chanting the hare krishna mantra so 16 such rounds one has to chant every day and one has to also follow four regulative principles regulative principles are prohibitions uh, of the major sinful activities that people generally indulge in in this age the four major sinful activities are meat eating taking intoxication uh, indulging in illicit sex and gambling so these four sinful activities have to be avoided and 16 rounds of hare krishna mantra has to be chanted every day for anybody who is serious about practicing spiritual life and perfecting it within the present life achieving highest perfection at the end of this life guaranteed so that is uh, what is recommended by the acharya based on the scriptures and anybody who Uh, follows this is certainly a surrendered soul to lord krishna the next question uh, in the bhagavad gita krishna says whenever there is a time of irreligion he comes he appears he incarnates so this is time certainly of irreligion uh, many pseudo spiritualists come up with a theory that i am incarnation of krishna i am incarnation of god appear to deliver all people surrender to me these incarnations demand surrender to me from the people how to refute this argument so 
we should understand how to recognize a bona fide or a genuine incarnation of the supreme lord the scriptures are explaining the acharyas are explaining first of all an incarnation of god is definitely mentioned in the authorized authentic scriptures just like in the shrimad bhagavatam where incarnations are mentioned this bhagavatam was spoken 5000 years back compiled 5000 years about 5000 years back so in the bhagavatam it's already written in future god is going to incarnate in the form of buddha so we know buddha appeared about 2500 years back so buddha's incarnation was already recorded or uh, described in the shrimad bhagavatam so first point is an incarnation is already mentioned in the scriptures secondly the uh, form the features the the specific activities for which the incarnation is appearing is also described already in the scriptures it is not that this so called incarnation or somebody says i am an incarnation you don't know about it i am informing you no it is never like that thirdly the incarnation is recognized by those who are authorized uh, mm-hmm. devotees who study the scriptures and who are able to recognize the incarnation based on the descriptions in the scriptures just like when chaitanya mahaprabhu appeared there was a great astrologer one expert devotee in astrological science who actually based on the horoscope prepared at the time of the birth of the child jata karma it's called so by studying the horoscope he could ascertain that this child is actually an incarnation of the supreme lord krishna how could he ascertain the specific horoscope belongs only to krishna or his incarnations it's called narayana jataka anybody else's uh, horoscope will have some auspicious characteristics and some inauspicious characteristics only narayana's jataka or horoscope or the supreme lord's incarnations horoscope will have 100% everything auspicious in the horoscope nobody else can have it it's very very easy for, that is possible to be determined by somebody who is a expert astrologer who can read the horoscope prepare the horoscope correctly and read the horoscope and ascertain this so like this and also on the palm of the hand of the supreme lord's incarnation there are specific symbols just like krishna's palm and krishna appeared there were specific marks of a flag a thunderbolt like this a, a conch an umbrella an elephant goad there are specific symbols mentioned each incarnation has got specific symbols generally others have some lines nobody has any special symbols on the palm of their hand only the supreme lord his incarnation will have these marks so like this there are so many different um, specific characteristics of an incarnation so without these characteristics without ascertaining the specific characteristics of the particular incarnation uh, nobody should be accepted as an incarnation what's the difference between goloka vrindavan and vaikuntha actually there is a spiritual world beyond this material world the spiritual world is in the spiritual sky just like in the material sky we have the material world which is consisting of so many planets similarly there are so many planets spiritual planets in the spiritual sky now there are many 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 different planets and uh, all of them 
are called Vaikuntha Loka. This is the specific term. Vaikuntha means that place where there is no anxiety at all. No miseries, no anxiety. Vaikuntha, place completely free from anxiety always. So that is one of the special characteristics of the spiritual world, spiritual planets. And secondly, among these millions of spiritual planets, which are all called Vaikuntha Lokas, there is one special planet, which is personal planet of Krishna, called Krishna Loka or Goloka Vrindavana. There, Krishna is actually present as a covered boy. He is there with his devotees. And everyone in the spiritual planet is a devotee of Krishna in Krishna Loka. And in the other planets, there are uh, uh, the Supreme Lord is present in his 400 form called the Narayana form. So the Lord is present in the form of Narayana in all the Vaikuntha Lokas, millions of spiritual planets in the spiritual sky, the spiritual world. And only in one planet called Krishna Loka, the Supreme Lord is present as Krishna, 200 form. And he is there with all his devotees. Even Narayana is there with all his devotees in the Vaikuntha Loka. So the difference is in, the, in terms of the um, form of the Lord. The form of the Lord in Goloka Vrindavana or Krishna Loka is two-handed. And the form of the Lord in all Vaikuntha Lokas is four-handed. Besides that, the kind of relationship devotees have with the Supreme Lord. In the Goloka Vrindavana, devotees have a very intimate relationship with Krishna where they are not very much cognizant of Krishna's supreme powerful position. In Vaikuntha, all the devotees are fully cognizant and very very conscious of Narayana being the Supreme Lord, supremely powerful and having um, unlimited opulences, unlimited knowledge, unlimited wealth, unlimited everything. So in Krishna in Goloka Vrindavana is present as one of the many covered boys. He is present uh, in different relationships he is situated. There are devotees who are uh, situated in a relationship just like Yashoda is Krishna's mother. Now she is a devotee. She is actually subordinate to Krishna. She is serving Krishna but she serves in the mood of in a relationship of being Krishna's mother. Krishna agrees to become a subordinate to his own devotees out of love for them. So it's a loving relationship of uh, uh, between Krishna and his devotees that actually uh, is, the is the reason why Krishna is even accepting a subordinate position to his own devotees. Even though he is the Lord, he remains the Lord, he is always the Lord. So these are some of the differences. Next question, what is the meaning of offering and honoring? Uh, the prasadam to the Supreme Lord. So offering uh, food before we eat to the Supreme Lord is what is recommended in the Bhagavad Gita and all the scriptures. That is, if we don't offer food before we consume that food, then that food is full of karma, food is full of material contamination, Whereas when we prepare food, of course, it has to be pure vegetarian food. That food which Krishna recommends in the scripture, in the Bhagavad Gita and all the uh, other scriptures also, the Supreme Lord recommends what type of food we can offer to him. It's only pure vegetarian food. If we prepare such food and offer it to Krishna, offer it to the Supreme Lord, and then partake the remnants as prasadam, then that food, first thing is it becomes completely free from karma. It doesn't have any of the uh, 
material contamination. Material contamination is completely uh, purified. Secondly, by offering to Krishna, the food becomes enriched with Krishna's love. So, when we partake remnants of food offered to Krishna, which is called Krishna Prasadam, literally it means Krishna's mercy. So, we, get, we are able to take food minus all the material contamination. We are able to eat pure food. And secondly, the food is also going to enrich our own devotion within our heart. Our devotion, which is already in our heart, which is lying dormant, is awakened. Little by little, as we keep on taking prasadam, it is awakened. Every activity of bhakti, every activity of devotion performed is going to awaken our dormant devotion, including taking prasadam. One who has killed a brahmana, a cow, his father, mother or spiritual master can be immediately freed from all sinful reactions simply by chanting the holy name of the Supreme Lord Narayana. That's what it is told in the Bhagavatam. Will they not get any punishment for their misdeeds? Somebody is asking this question. They've done so many sinful activities. Just because they chanted the name of Narayana, they go scot free. They don't get any punishment. Well, we have to understand specifically that most of the time people are in ignorance about certain types of sinful activities they perform. But still, even if somebody does a sinful activity, whether knowingly or unknowingly, they are liable to be punished by the laws of God in this world. But if somebody takes to devotional service after realizing that the goal of life is actually Krishna and I have got a relationship with Krishna, I am meant to revive my forgotten or lost relationship with Krishna. Therefore, I have to engage in devotional service beginning with chanting Hare Krishna. Then such a person is pardoned by the Supreme Lord and given an opportunity to utilize the human form of life for actually perfecting the devotional service and achieving the perfection. So after one takes to devotional service, one has to stop all sinful activities completely and no more engage and beg forgiveness for whatever was done before beginning devotional service, beg forgiveness, then the Lord pardons and then one should never again commit any sin. If one thinks because the Lord is forgiving, now I can do more sinful activities, again I can do some bhakti, again I become free. No, that is not going to work. It is never that one can go on sinning and chanting name of Narayana or doing some bhakti or doing some devotional service and they'll be pardoned. No, it is only one time, particularly when a person was not knowing about God properly, was not having proper understanding of what is bhakti, was not aware of what is the goal of life and somehow by contact with a another devotee, with a pure devotee, one comes to know about bhakti and then begins to perform devotional service, giving up all sinful activities after that beginning of bhakti. Then they are pardoned and then they don't have to suffer any sinful reactions. I'll stop here. We'll continue with more questions tomorrow. Hare Krishna.